Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at munitions and clothing production, railways and shipbuilding, and shipping and overseas trade. We hear now from Professor Hugh Murphy about shipbuilding during the war. My name is Professor Hugh Murphy. I'm affiliated to the University of Glasgow. I'm visiting reader on maritime history at the National Maritime Museum, Royal Museums Greenwich. I'm also the series editor of the Research and Maritime History series at the University of Liverpool. I'm going to look at the impact of the First World War and the private British shipbuilding and ship repair industries with emphasis on Clydeside. In 1913, there was a record launching of almost 2 million gross tons for the industry, and in the Clyde, which was the world's premier shipbuilding river, nearly three quarters of a million tons were launched by 29 firms. The private British shipbuilding and ship repair industries were the world's largest, as was marine engine building. Britain also had the largest navy, the largest mercantile marine, which was four times the size of Germany. At the outbreak of war, the sheer size and scope of our maritime industries meant that we could ride out most eventualities in a war of indeterminate duration. On the outbreak of war, the Admiralty took control of direction of shipbuilding, but not day-to-day control. Shipbuilders were left very much to do as they had done before, as were the ship repair firms. There was no real organisation, but throughout the war, the emphasis was on war shipbuilding. In the first weeks of the war, a great deal of shipbuilding workers joined up. At Beardmore, maybe 500 before September 1914. At D&W Henderson, which was a very small yard, over 350 men joined up, 16 of them in staff positions. And on the Tyne, maybe 1,800 people joined up at Ellswick for Armstrong Whitworth. Beardmore's men eventually were about 1,560, of which 181 were killed. So that had an effect on the labour situation right at the beginning of the war. It put the remaining men in a stronger bargaining position, and it also allowed them to ask for the employment of their older unemployed brethren. Shipbuilding was a casualised industry, as was ship repair. It was very much related to demand. Workers were quite used to working for short periods of time, being laid off, and if they were in a concentrated district such as the Clyde, they would maybe move to another yard. The work process was organised in squads, especially for the metal joining, which was riveting, the four or five man riveting squad, and they'd go around most of the yards at different times of the year, depending on what the order book was like. You could hear them before you seen them, the infernal clanging of metal against metal. Most of them were stone deaf as a result. There was no compensation there for industrial deafness. Most of them smoked. They had biceps like Popeye. <laughs> they were paid by a system of every hundred rivets they deposited. They were paid a certain amount of piecework rate. A rivet counter would come around with a boy who would paint red lead paint on the rivets to show that they'd actually did them and so that they couldn't claim that they were more rivets than they actually did. Riveting squads and platers are the most important squads in the hull trade. Platers were probably at the apex of the production process, but riveters actually put the ship together. Plating was also a very skilled occupation because one had to bend and roll plates to particular angles to fit the ship and everything would be riveted. You would start with the keel and move up through the strakes and through the sides of the ship. After riveting, it would then be caulked. Caulkers was a distinct trade too. Caulking makes the ship watertight and they all belong to the Boiler Maker Society. Well, labour shortage was not really a problem until conscription occurs in 1916. After that, it becomes more problematic and women enter the industry under schemes of dilution, which basically meant they were allowed to do some tasks in the shipyards, but not a great deal. Nationally, 3% of the shipbuilding workforce were female and 6% of the marine engineering industry 
were women by the end of 1918. That's exactly the same percentages as in the Second World War too. Women did work in riveting squads, but as heaters and catchers. You heat the rivet in a charcoal fire. You then take it out with tongs when it's white hot. You give it to the catcher, and the catcher throws it up. It's then caught again, normally in someone's bonnet, by the way. In the inside of the hull, there's a guy called the holder on, and the riveters at the other side of the hull. That's the old way of doing it. But by 1916, pneumatic riveting guns were widely used and much more efficient. Women also worked on the marine engineering side as turners, fitters on machines like centre lift turning. Before women became heaters, it was always done by young boys, and the catcher was usually a young boy too. The riveter was a male, as was the holder on. They were very, very strong men because you had to be in the old days. Even to hold a riveting gun for 12 hours a day took a great deal of strength. The problem with the shipyard workers who enlisted in September 1914 was by 1916, most of the shipyards were wanting them back because the amount of tonnage were losing to the U-boat. It then becomes imperative by 1917 the second unrestricted U-boat campaign from February to September 1917, that we build more cargo ships, especially because the rate of sinkings is increasing exponentially. Some men were sent back to the yards, riveters especially, because riveters were in short supply. The industry in 1914 produced about a million and a half tonnes of shipping, but that was a carryover from 1913. After 1915, 1916, 17, it produced very little in the sense of mercantile shipping, but concentrated mostly on warship work. From 1914 to 1918, two million standard displacement tonnes of warship was built. And only in 1914, did new construction exceed losses of ships to the U-boat, cruisers and mines. By 1917, there was a programme of building standard ships to government account because the government realised we really needed more ships. As Lloyd George said, we need ships, ships and ships. A standard ship would take about five and a half months from the keel to completion. So immediately there was a deficit The new Ministry of Shipping at the end of 1916 ordered 52 ships from Canada, Hong Kong, Shanghai and North America. But it did take some time for the standard shipbuilding programme to get started. The government also instituted a national yard in Chepstow on the River Wye at the confluence with the Severn, but it never built a ship until after the armistice. The private shipbuilders would not divert workers to it. They looked after their own interests. The impact of the war was the industry increased its capacity to build to nominally around 3 million gross tonnes a year. That was done by an extension to existing berths. Also, two new shipyards were built, one at Haverton Hill and Tees and one at Burnt Island in Fife but none of them had produced ships by the time of the armistice. So after the armistice, we had an industry whose capacity had grown by about 25%. There was a short-lived post-war boom as people wanted to replace shipping loss to the U-boats, and we went at very high prices, so that was good for the shipbuilders. But by 1921, freight rates had plummeted, and shipbuilding was in the doldrums because no one was ordering ships. The rate of unemployment in 1923 was 65% of the insured workforce, and by 1932 it was 75%. So the interwar period was almost barren as far as shipbuilding was concerned. There was some ocean lining building after the war, but not many. There was an act called the Trades Facilities Act which helped shipbuilding in the early 1920s, but it was of limited use. As I say, the interwar period was almost barren until rearmament kicks in in 1936 and the warship building firms start getting big orders again. And when you get a big order from the Navy, it's big profits too. By 1938, 
the warship firms are again in profit, but the mercantile builders are still very depressed. They recover slightly during the war. After 1950, it's the long boom in international trade, but by 1956, Japan has overtaken Britain as the world's major producer. And after that, it's all downhill to the demise of most of the industry in the 1980s. That was Professor Hugh Murphy on shipbuilding during the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Martin Wilcox about shipping and overseas trade.